Hey everybody, we should be live. How's it all going? I hope you're having a, uh, I, I don't even know what, time has no meaning. I hope you're having a sequence of events that happen linearly moving through time in a way that seems like it makes some kind of sense to you. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome back to Open Space. Uh, so apologies, we didn't do an Open Space last week. That was because I'm sure at this point you've heard one of our moderators, Paranor, uh, passed away just uh, the day of Open Space. And so we took the day off and uh, or took the show off and the moderators and, and I and a bunch of other people just hung out in the uh, Cosmo Quest Discord and just chatted and, and hung out and it was nice. Um, so I... Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about it quite a bit, I think, at this point. But once again, my, uh, you know, sort of sad, sad thoughts about a loss in our community. And um, we'll miss you, Tim. Uh, all right. So this uh, this week, um, just let me know uh, what you want to talk about. This is your show. This is not my show. I am your humble servant here to just talk about whatever topics you guys are interested in um we've got of course the moderators who are hanging out they'll copy paste any of the questions that you guys bring up and we'll put them into the chat uh that's why when i look up i'm looking up at questions that people have uh have copy pasted and um and you know we can talk about uh, Primordial Black Holes, which is the latest episode. We can talk about uh, Venus, of course, and um, any current events happening in space and astronomy. <laughs> Arjun, what if we experience time like in Arrival? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, if, if it allows us to predict the future, uh, that would be all right. Um, so uh, just some more uh, updates. Um, this week, we are talking, uh, let's see, I've got an interview coming up. I haven't Actually, I don't know the actual time yet, but this week I'm going to be talking to a researcher who has been working on the concept of super habitable planets. So planets that are better than the Earth um, in terms of biodiversity. You wouldn't want to live there, but they would be better. Um, so that's coming up. Uh, I, it'll happen this week. It's going to happen probably early because the researcher is in Europe. So expect a very early morning uh, for Pacific time. Uh, but it'll be nice for the people in Europe. Um, let's... Uh, um, and then next week, next Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, we have an interview with Seth Shostak. And we've interviewed him before on the on the weekly space hangout but he's going to hang out here with me on open space for an hour and the date and time to still be uh announced which would be great i mean we'll talk about seti search for aliens we'll get to the bottom we will answer once and for all the fermi paradox um people ask me why i blather on at the beginning of the episode and the reason is because there are no questions yet and so we need to give people a, just a few minutes to join the show, uh, post their questions. It takes about five minutes. So you're going to have to, you know, for those of you who are just like watching the show afterwards, I'm like, why is Fraser just talking? He's not talking about anything interesting. Apologies. Just give it, give it five minutes and then we will go. All right. I think we got a couple of questions. Um, uh, Zapfan Zapfan is asking, any Chinese news about the Mars mission? I have not seen anything interesting. I read an article in Chinese um, uh, about a month ago, and they were just talking about the radiation environment that the probe was going through. They were tracking its movements as it was making its way to Mars. Uh, this is the Tianwen spacecraft, Tianwen-1 and it's going to be arriving at Mars, sort of with the rest of the of the collection of, of Mars spacecraft in sort of early 2021. But apart from that, it's a very long, boring flight at this point. So we will uh, we'll have to just wait and see see what happens when they go through their version of the five minutes, seven minutes of terror. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. The I mean, if anyone from the Chinese space agency is watching, please just just 
be as transparent as possible about all the information that's happening with your spacecraft. People here want to find out. Uh, <laughs> Neko Girl asks, um, talk about the phosphine on Venus. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to need a more specific question than that because we have done a video on it. We've done a question show where we pretty much focused on it. I did another question. We did a live question show where we pretty much focused on it. So at this point, I'm going to need a specific question because I sort of feel like we've, we've hit every version of it. Uh, Ronald Mitch, how many exoplanets are confirmed and how certain are they that planets were discovered? So we're, I mean, you can always go to the exoplanet catalog. Uh, let me see what the current number is right now. The Exoplanet Catalog from NASA says there are 4,284 confirmed planets, an additional 5,573 candidates. So uh, there are 4,284 confirmed planets. And when astronomers use the word confirmed, what they th that's a pretty significant level of observation. It means that they have seen uh, enough of either a transit signal or a radial velocity signal or a direct imaging signal uh, or an astrometry signal that tells them with a high degree of certainty, with confirmation from other people, that a planet is truly indeed there. And that's why you've got that big number. You've got that number of 5,573 candidates. So there are more, more candidate planets than there are uh, confirmed planets at this point. And there will kind of always be because you've got these spacecraft that are just, they're just digging up, just even single detections. And they're just throwing them on the pile and, and letting other people follow on to try and make the confirmations. So it takes just time. Um, how, so how certain? That's when, when astronomers say that there are confirmed planets. That means they are very certain. Um, whoa. All right. Uh, Visto Tutti is asking, do any of the Mars rovers have equipment to drill for microbes? So the latest, I mean, the spacecraft that's going to be going, the next NASA spacecraft, right? The Perseverance rover is the most life searching spacecraft rover that's ever been sent to the surface of Mars. I mean, you got the Viking experiment, which scooped up a bunch of dirt, fed it, uh, watered it, and the results were inconclusive. Some people are certain they found life, other people not so sure. So when um, uh, Perseverance is going to go, its job, when you know, when you follow on this, this pathway, right, the, the spirit and opportunity, their job was to say, was there ever liquid water on the surface of Mars? And the answer is yes. Curiosity's job was to say, was there liquid water on the surface of Mars for long periods of time? And the answer is yes. So Perseverance's job <clears throat> is to say, were there the conditions for life, like conducive for life on the surface of Mars for long periods of time? And that is the next open question. I think we're going to assume that the answer is going to be yes, but they're going to be looking for, Perseverance is going to be looking for the kinds of chemicals that life would like to know about, the kinds of <clears throat> output chemicals that maybe could have been produced by life. It's not going to be drilling, but it's going to be grinding, uh, it's going to be scooping, it's going to be baking, analyzing various samples. And then it's going to be uh, pooping them out onto the surface of Mars that then some follow-on Mars sample return mission can come along and grab and bring back to, to, uh, to Earth. So we're not at a point now where anyone is going to be able to dig down deep yet. And there was actually a, a paper that I saw like last week that you would need to go really deep to actually be able to reach the kinds of reserves where life could be flourishing on Mars, like hundreds of meters, kilometers deep down. And we really just don't have the technology. We barely have the technology to do that here on Earth, to go that level of depth, to be able to do that on another world. I mean, just imagine 
the the number of uh, deep core drillers, the amount of Bruce Willis's you'd have to send to Mars to be able to drill down hundreds of meters, kilometers under the surface of Mars. So it's going to be decades before we're able to start doing a very serious analysis into the most habitable places on Mars. I mean, we've got this recent, like just again, yesterday, two days ago, Friday maybe, um, announcement of three more under subsurface ponds on Mars. But they are deep and you're gonna need a fairly comprehensive, complicated spacecraft. It's gonna be humans with drilling equipment to be able to really dig down there. So um, uh, just stay tuned. Um, Jiro, Giro, Jiro the hero. Is there a material that could withstand the heat of Venus better now versus what was used in the past? Yeah, the um, researchers have been doing a lot of really interesting work in trying to make a spacecraft be able to survive on the surface of Venus, not just like last for a couple of hours until it melts, but to be able to do serious work for days, weeks, months, etc. And and we. Um, there's sort of two pathways that they're going about this. One is that they've developed some new kinds of electronics that can handle very high temperatures. Like they put it into ovens and they're still able to function. Uh, and that's been a huge development that's happened just in the last couple of years. And that's going to probably do the heavy lifting. Any spacecraft that now goes to the surface of Venus is going to be equipped with these high heat capacity electronics. But then there's some other ideas that could make a rover last longer. One idea is this concept of a Stirling engine, but you sort of run the Stirling engine in reverse where you are um, uh, you're absorbing the heat and you're slowly letting it into the interior of your of your vehicle and the in the heat differential you're you know you're running this the Stirling engine as a way to to try to slowly let the heat into the interior vehicle until it cooks it um, and then the other idea is the idea of like a purely mechanical rover one that has no electronics or, or very minimal electronics and uses mechanical methods for doing everything when you think about those you know, imagine something that is, say, wind powered and has a little windmill on top of it. And as the windmill turns, the rover's um, uh, wheels turn. And then maybe it's got some sort of thing that's on the top that's spinning. And it's like a mirror. And as the mirror is spinning, it's able to provide some kind of data back up to space. So uh, there's some really interesting. Now, we've done a whole video on some rover concepts. But I think whatever is the next rover that's going to be going. In fact, NASA just did a pretty great challenge where they asked people to come up with lots and lots of ideas for rover concepts that could be purely mechanical or survive down on the surface of Venus for, for long periods of time. So it's a pretty exciting field right now. And I think within the next, I'll, I'll, I'll get one of the people who, who's been working on it to, onto the channel and we'll, and we'll talk about it because it's pretty exciting. Um... All right, so NIFT, uh, how do you know if an exoplanet candidate has cleared its orbital path to become an actual exoplanet? Um, yeah, um, the assumption, I mean, there is no way to know if an exoplanet is has completely cleared its orbit. I mean, it's the same thing here in the solar system. We consider Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, etc., to be planets poor Pluto because it hasn't cleared its its pathway uh, you can but I mean from this kind of a distance you won't know if there's anything else in the orbit with the with the planet if it's a fairly young star and young planets then you would expect there to be some amount of mayhem going on in the uh, in the in the orbital areas and then if it's a much older star like our sun then you would expect that the planets have settled down and they smash into each other as much as they're going to do so what's kind of fascinating is you can actually see the planetary rings or, or the um you know in the accretion disks of newly forming star systems with the planets embedded inside of them you can actually see the planets clearing out the rings clearing out their their various orbits as they're orbiting around this this newly forming star and then as the star gets you know evolves and gets uh, older than its stellar winds kick in and they blow out all that intervening dust 
And then whatever objects are left will start smashing into each other until you get a more mature solar system like what we've got. But there is no, um, you know, there's no real easy way to see that they've actually cleared that out. You just would detect, you know, every three months you see a blob move in front of the star that tells you that there's a planet there, but not necessarily that there's other stuff that's smaller that's just not transit, creating the same level of transit signal. Um, Warbash, is anyone else dissatisfied with the Big Bang Theory and the lack of advancement made in unified theory, even with all the technological advancements made in recent decades? Uh, all of astronomy, all of cosmology is, is <clears throat> I brought water just for this exact reason. Astronomers are very aware that the Big Bang Theory is incomplete that that there are uh, elements of the universe that cannot be explained by the Big Bang Theory in its current version. And this is this idea that you, you know, at one point in the ancient past, all of the material in the observable universe was uh, compressed into a region that was very small, and then it expanded apart, and we have the universe that we see today. But if you just go backwards, you know, if you, you take the assumption that the, uh, that the universe is, you know, we look around us in all directions and we see the galaxies moving away from us. We look back into the farthest regions that we can and we see the cosmic microwave background radiation, then we know that the Big Bang Theory holds beautifully until you get to the cosmic microwave background. And in fact, you can run the math before that. So that's like, you know, 13 billion years, 14 billion years, all the way back to 380,000 years after the, the beginning of the universe. And then you can go farther back. And in fact, you can go all the way back to just fractions of a second where the math beautifully holds together. And then it's just in that first fraction of a second where there are some problems with the Big Bang Theory. And so you, this is what the whole idea of inflation is. The idea of inflation is, is a way to say, okay, you, the, there are some, some problems with the way the Big Bang works as the, how the theory works to the, what the observation is. And when you overlay this idea that, okay, in the first few moments of the early universe, the universe expanded this, this exponential speed and then, and then the expansion went at this rate that we see today, then that explains all of these shortfallings of the Big Bang Theory itself. And, and so it doesn't necessarily mean inflation is right, although there are, there are definitely hints to say that inflation is, is correct and more evidence is necessary. But, but when you say the Big Bang is wrong, um, the Big Bang is, is beautifully supported by mountains and mountains of evidence. And so, and, and really Big Bang, all the Big Bang says is that we see the universe um, getting less dense over time, which means that it was more dense in the past. And it doesn't, exp it doesn't the big, it's not the Big Bang's job to explain what came before the universe. The Big Bang takes over seconds after whatever led to those events. That's a whole other problem. And, and eventually cosmologists, theoreticians will come up, will figure out, they'll do the, they'll make observations, they'll develop models, they'll do particle phys physics experiments, and they will figure out what that little bit was in the beginning. And then they'll be able to connect those two theories together and they'll have a much better comprehensive understanding of what happened from the beginning of the universe to the universe, the more evolved universe that we see today. So, so whenever, and it's sort of like this, it's the exact same thing about people saying like, you know, does anyone have a problem with evolution? Because we don't know where life came from. Well, we see evolution all around us all the time. And it is one of the most well supported, well evidenced theories that exists in modern science, right? Uh, it's just that we don't know where the first, how evolution got started. But that doesn't mean that there's any problem with evolution through, you know, the process of evolution through natural selection. We see that all the time. So it's the same thing with the Big Bang. The Big Bang's job is not to explain where the universe came from. 
The Big Bang's only job is to explain uh, the rapid expansion of the universe and the fact that it's getting less dense over time. Um, Zach Perry, hey Fraser, what is your favorite potential solution to the whole Planet Nine problem? Uh, my favorite solution to it is that there is a large icy object out in the outer solar system that's causing a gravitational interaction with the other objects in the solar system. Um, space is big and the, um, you know, and the things that are far away from the sun that aren't producing light on their own are very difficult to see. And so it's not surprising. And so you could have an object that's very large, but very far away causing a gravitational interaction. Um, all right. So that's what I think, but I'm also perfectly fine with it being nothing that there was just some, you know, it's a, the researchers who've found who are, are proposing planet nine, it's just that they're seeing a statistical, um, uh, gravitational interaction of all of the objects in the outer solar system. And, and it can be explained by a object with, with a gravitational mass that is, you know, like Neptune, but it could also just be a random chance. It could just be a fluke that all of those objects happen to be in the places that they are and no planet nine is necessary. Uh, the bottom line is that we need, um, the Vera Rubin observatory to help us get to the answer. Cause this is the machine that'll find it. And, and all the asteroids and all the comets and all the supernovae and all of the really interesting thing, all the ways that the universe goes bump in the night. So, uh, I can't, cannot wait. If, if anyone tells you that, that the Vera Rubin observatory is, uh, you know, the telescope that nobody's been telling you about or heard about, Oh, if I've been, just nagging about the Vera Rubin Observatory for years now. Irish asks, how long have you been keeping up with all things space? Uh, well, so I've always been a space nerd. I'm 49 years old now, um, and I guess I was a space nerd since I was five years old. I watched uh, the first space shuttle launch in 1981. I watched, uh, I read information about the, the Viking missions. I uh, watched the TV when the Mariners, sorry, when the, um, when the Magellan spacecraft was at Venus, I watched, uh, I was at, I was in one of my first jobs when the Pathfinder landed on Mars. I started Universe Today as my actual hobby, then turned into a career in 1999. So I've been doing this job, this pretty much exact job, although it was mostly in text, but, but, uh, but it has transitioned to, to podcasts and videos but I've been doing this for 21 years now. Will it be 22 years? Time has no meaning. Uh, I've been doing it since 1999. So 21 years come 22 years. Anyway. Yeah. A long time. I, I forget now. Um, Ooh, Neko girl asks. Okay. So you now you got your question, Neko girl. Um, how likely do you think, the phosphine excess on Venus is abiotic and I had a bunch of people, uh, link me to a video from Thunderfoot, just him, just dunking on the phosphine discovery of Venus. And, and that's like, obviously the most likely answer is that it's abiotic, that there is some process that we don't understand that is causing this signal of phosphine in the atmosphere of, of Venus. And it's just like the discovery of the megastructures, um, which turned out to just be gas, the discovery of an extra solar, uh, sorry, an extra, uh, sorry, interstellar object, Oumuamua, which is probably just a rock, right? And one of the things that can create a signal of phosphine is life, but it's, there's, there's no evidence that there is the life that's doing it. And so when the researchers proposed, you know, came up with all the various things, they did the best that they could to button down every single source of phosphine that they could figure out. They looked at volcanoes, they looked at lightning strikes, they looked at solar wind interactions with the atmosphere. They looked at ways that the phosphine was getting from the surface to the, to the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. But they also just said, Hey, science community, now's your turn 
to, to figure it out. Like if anyone has an idea, they are ready and open and that's how science works. And now you've got hundreds of minds. I'm seeing tons of papers. Like we just reported on a paper of last week about that. Actually, there's probably a way that volcanoes could transmit uh, that level of phosphine from, you know, it's coming up from the interior of Venus and then somehow making it up into the upper atmosphere and it can explain it. So you're going to see this process go back and forth for years, for decades. Uh, if there's one thing I can tell you as a person who's been doing this now for 20 years more, uh, this is not my first rodeo. I know exactly how this plays out. I've seen it many times before. There's an amazing discovery there is uh, where the researchers, they're, they're saying like, hey, we found this thing. Science, sort it out. And then science sorts it out. Uh, remember the, the microbes discovery on Mars? Didn't turn out to be a thing. Remember the um, discovery of arsenic-based life in, in California? Didn't turn out to be a thing. So almost certainly, this isn't gonna be, this is gonna, this is gonna turn out to be not a thing. But the proper way to respond to that is with a scientific paper and with math. That's how a scientist responds to a situation is they write a paper and then they get it peer reviewed and they submit that to, um, to the journals. And then the scientists get to respond to that and get to dig up other stuff and on and on the system goes as we slowly find our way as you know, nature reveals her secrets one at a time. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's almost certainly, if I was to like guess, I would say it's 99% likely that it is abiotic, that it is not life on Venus that's producing it. But even if it's not, then it means it's a brand new methodology, an abiotic method of producing phosphine in the atmosphere of a planet. And that's very exciting because we are looking, you know, astronomers are looking for methods that they can search for life on other star systems that are, that are light years away from us. And so to have a planet that's right next door that you can just run these experiments on uh, is incredible because then we can send balloons into the atmosphere of Venus. We can send landers. We can send um, orbiters and things that can monitor the cloud system and perform these kinds of observations. We can't do that with any other planet out there. We can only observe them with our powerful telescopes. And so to go through this process locally at Venus is wonderful. And uh, I can't wait to see how it turns out. Uh, all right. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so uh, Nolan asks, I hear there's a radiation field around Jupiter. How intense is it? Would it prevent people from ever being able to approach the Jupiter sphere of influence? So I'm not sure exactly how intense the magnetosphere, the radiation sphere around Jupiter is at various distances, but I do know that if you're on the surface of Europa, thanks to that, you're experiencing um, uh, 1,000, 800 times the radiation that you would be experiencing on the surface of Earth. And if you were sitting on the moon, you'd be experiencing about 200 times the amount of radiation that you would experience on the surface of the Earth. So it's bad. Like, I think it's about a 50-50 chance of killing you within a month. If you're on Jupiter, you spend a month on Jupiter, you're dead within about a month. Uh, links, links of long time viewers know that you're a gamer, go to RimWorld. Is there a chance for us to watch you play or is your safe haven to unwind without us fans nagging you in the chat? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, I play a ton of games. Yeah, I play, uh, I play a lot of strategy games. So I play some space games. I play uh, RimWorld. Um, man, I should look at my list of games. Uh, Darkest Dungeon, I'm pretty good at that. Uh, Battle Brothers. Um, uh, I've been playing some No Man's Sky, actually, which is a lot of fun. I, I played Stellaris a while back and actually streamed it on my Twitch stream. And, and it is tough because 
it's hard to be both enjoying the game but also trying to provide an entertaining stream and i feel like like my job is to bring a high level of energy and and knowledge about space and astronomy and be here and answer your questions I'm not great at those games. And I suspect that if I was just like hanging out, playing RimWorld or whatever, you'd want to talk about space. <laughs> and so I'd be like distracted from my game. Uh, so so that's, that's sort of where my brain is at. Um, I do like the idea. I mean, I like the idea of being more, just more interactive and more transparent about the work that we do. But, but I'm more interested in trying to bring the interviews that we do, the work that the that the that our our reporters are doing, you know, like like University Today is a pretty big machine at this point. It's not just me. There's uh, you can see there's all the moderators in the chat. There is uh, you know the writing team. We've got probably ten writers at University Today. Uh, Chad doing all the editing. There's all of the people who are associated with Astronomy Cast and CosmoQuest and and the Weekly Space Hangout. Like it's a pretty big uh, group and and I would love to sort of try to take some of the spotlight off of me and try to share it to the other people who are who are involved in the process and so I think that's a thing that we're going to try to do more of it's just you know like like let's the verge did a pretty good job of that I don't know if anyone listens to the podcast the verge podcast but they would have a sort of a roundup of the different writers on the team who are working on interesting stories this week and they talk about it and I, I I'm kind of I'd like to do that kind of thing so so that's it I mean you know it's tons of games um uh, I should try EVE Online I've tried played a lot of EVE Online my experience with EVE Online is mostly just floating in space in a capsule after my spaceship got exploded um so yeah I think people like the idea of me streaming games better than I think the reality of me streaming games. And I do like to be able to just jump away from the computer and, and be able to deal with stuff around the house and life and all that kind of stuff and not feel like, okay, you know, I'm so much of my life is already <laughs> streamed. So that's my, that's my feeling. And, um, I also think that the life of the Twitch streamer is kind of unsustainable. So, so I'm not a, I can see it kind of wearing people out unless they are very well sort of mentally able to compartmentalize the work that they, that they do. So my preference is to go the podcast route, to go the whatever stuff that's archival. But that's just my, you know, it's just my preference. So, uh, but I thought it'd be cool, like, like it would be kind of fun to, I've even tried this. Like if you want to join me while I write an episode of, of the guide to space you can just see how my brain works if you want to see a journalist do work um uh that would be kind of interesting so anyway um and damien reload is saying ever consider adding a game main episode once in a while maybe using a game to talk about like scott does yeah i mean scott is just a beast scott we're talking about scott manley here um and he is he's just a fun like Scott Manley, I believe, is from another dimension. I'm, if we need proof of some sort of extraterrestrials visiting us, Scott Manley is possibly uh, evidence number one because he is a programmer in real life. He's an incredibly knowledgeable person about, about space and astronomy and space exploration and rockets and is uh, just, he's, he's pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah, if I could, if I, if I had whatever special secret sauce Scott Manley is made out of beyond the haircut, uh, that would be amazing. Um, all right. Apologies. Uh, oh man, there's so many good questions. All right. Sorry. I'm just, apologies to the people who are listening on the podcast. There's so many good ones. Okay. So Arjun is asking, could we detect planets in the Mag Magellanic Clouds? Um, it, it would be tougher, right? I mean, uh, the Magellanic Clouds are, are pretty far away. They're like a couple of hundred thousand light years away. And our ability to, to be able to properly find planets up close, uh, you know, beyond dozens, hundreds of light years at the farthest 
is is pretty tough. That said, um, you know, there was an announcement last week. Some researchers had found a planet in a galaxy, like the Whirlpool galaxy, like M51, which is um, 37 million light years away. Uh, that's amazing, uh, but but it was like a one-time event they saw, and it's like clearly it's like some planet orbiting a black hole or a neutron star or or something like that. So uh, it's a it's not a very dependable methodology. So I don't think we're going to be able to get a lot of planets in the Magellanic Cloud anytime soon without much larger telescopes, much more comprehensive. But it's it would be amazing. I mean, to be able to to see a number of planets in a in a dwarf galaxy like the Magellanic Clouds or the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which is the closest one. I think it's merely 75,000 light years away. Um, would tell us if planets are common in galaxies, you know, in dwarf galaxies, which is a different environment from from large spiral you know mature spiral galaxies like the milky way so it's a very interesting question but they're so far away um there you go t home got your question there um kelvin on would a civilization living near a black hole measure the universe differently do different perceived time alter anything uh yeah if you had a civilization that was huddled up to a black hole, they would experience the universe differently than someone who is farther away from a gravity well like we are. They would see the universe moving more quickly. And there's a kind of a, there's a really interesting, um, and that's because of relativity, right? Uh, time dilation. So whenever you are in a gravity well, you experience time differently than when you're farther away from a gravity well. And you think about the movie Interstellar. They spent a day down or an hour down on this planet that was orbiting around this supermassive black hole. And then when they came up, decades had gone by for the rest of the universe, which is, um, and so it's, so, so that. So imagine every hour that you spend on your planet orbiting around the black hole, the rest of the universe is experiencing decades. And, and so you would be able to get energy from the black, you know, as long as you feed the black hole, then it's going to, then, then you're going to get bursts of radiation, bad radiation. You're going to get, you're going to, you're going to get, um, you know, gamma radiation. So you've got to be able to have a way to shield that and turn that into useful heat, but it's the most efficient place that you could go. But the other advantage is that you're going to have, essentially, you're going to be receiving energy from things like the cosmic microwave background more densely than if you were experiencing time at a slower rate. So you'll actually get a brighter cosmic microwave background. You'll be getting more photons shifted into the blue end of the spectrum. And so it's a way that you can um, use time like to change the clock speed on your computer essentially to be able to live longer and it's kind of a fascinating concept but theoretically uh, some future civilization I will will want to huddle up to the to a black hole as the way to, to survive the longest that they can into the universe so it's a it's a great idea um, <clears throat> Let's see. Curious Borg, what was the most memorable fun launch you've witnessed and why? I've only witnessed one launch, and that was Osiris Rex. So I was at the Osiris Rex launch back in, man, I don't know, years ago, three years ago, four years ago. Uh, I took my wife, Carla, we took Chad, we filmed it, and it was, uh, it was amazing. It was definitely a bucket list event. I've also tried to see a space shuttle back in 2011, actually, my father is a photographer <clears throat> by trade, and he was the person who got me into space and astronomy when I was a kid. And so I tried to pay him back. You know, he was the one who got, woke me up early in the morning, 5 o'clock in 1981, to watch the first space shuttle launch. And so I wanted to pay him back. And so I got him on the – he was – essentially he agreed to be the photographer for 
our trip to Cape Canaveral. And then my dad and I flew to Cape Canaveral and he brought his camera and video gear and, and shot. And we took a bunch of really amazing pictures of the space shuttle. We got a chance to see the space shuttle up close and we saw the astronauts talk and saw everything. Um, and then the space shuttle was delayed for, <laughs> for a month. And so we didn't get a chance to watch it. So it was uh, sort of bittersweet. We had a good time, but we didn't get a chance to watch the space shuttle. So that's it. Um, those are the only two. That's the only time. Those are the only two times that I've attempted to watch a rocket launch, and one was successful. the The rule, of course, is that one does not book a return flight from Cape Canaveral. You you book your flight out there, but you don't plan to come home until after your rocket has launched. You know, uh, for the people who are seeing, for example, this this uh, month has been Scrubtober. Like all of the rocket launches have been scrubbed so far, like four or five in a row at this point. So just don't, um, you know, uh, don't don't anticipate rocket launching when you're hoping to. But with the number of the cadence of launches increasing, your chances are so good. And I, I talk about this all the time that like if you want an easy, really exciting bucket list item to knock off, go watch a rocket launch. You go, you go out to Cape Canaveral, you know, maybe in a time when perhaps there was in a pandemic, you go to Cape Canaveral, you book a hotel on the beach, Cocoa Beach, it's beautiful, you sit on your deck with your Mai Tai, and you get a view of the rockets launching that is as good as the view that we get from the press area on the on at Cape Canaveral. So it's and you don't even have to like you can stay in a crappy hotel outside of town and drive to the beach and sit on the beach and watch the rockets go up and uh it's super easy if you live in the united states to be able to pull that off um let's see <laughs> dead inside have you seen the movie the end of quantum reality they claim that quantum mechanics is a big, ho big hoax uh no but, you know, anyone who claims that quantum mechanics is a big hoax doesn't understand quantum mechanics. I mean, your computer relies on quantum mechanics. Like, so much of modern electronic industry uh, absolutely depends on quantum mechanics. So it's like, the, um, it's like one of the most accurately measured sciences there are. So, no. Uh, but you know, like what a surprise people think things in science are hoaxes. That's, that's something we've heard before. Um, Chris Petrula, I recently bought everything I need for deep space observation, astrophotography, deep space object, astrophotography. What are some good targets for this fall and winter? I live in Saskatchewan. Well, the best target is coming which is going to be uh, the Orion Nebula, which uh, you'll start to see why well, it's up now if you're willing to stay up, get up early in the morning. In fact, maybe you should. If you live in Saskatchewan, now would be the time. Uh, just wait until um, early, uh, early morning and watch the, um, you know, point you know, whenever. I'm not sure the exact time that Orion is rising now, but it's going to be in the middle of the night for you. And it is, uh, you know, it's such a bright object. It's, it's a tricky object, actually, because the core of the Orion Nebula is very bright. There's these four bright stars called the trapezium, which blow out the rest of the nebula. And so you have to, in order to get some really good pictures of it, you have to be able to, to do uh, some, some compositing, where you take a couple of pictures of the core, and then you take longer exposure pictures of the, out, the outer regions of the nebula, and then you combine them together in a way that you find pleasing. So, but that's like the best object in the night sky, and it's coming. Um, <laughs> Vista 2D, have you seen the series Raised by Wolves? Very weird, but good sci-fi. Yeah, we watched Raised by Wolves. Uh, the beginning was wonderful. One of the most original pieces of sci-fi. Uh, very weird, and I loved the world building that they were doing. Uh, but the end just went right off the rails. So I, do I recommend it? Yes. But it really went into, I didn't enjoy 
the last half, the back half of the of the series, especially the the season finale. Without spoiler. Um, let's see. <laughs> hey, Cogmain, could we be living in black holes, and that's why we are not finding life? Uh, I, what would it mean to be living in a black hole? Um, if we're life and we're in a black hole, shouldn't we be able to find other life here in the black hole? So um, whether or not we live in a black hole, which there's no reason to believe that we do, um, there's, if we exist, then in theory, other life should exist. Rahustaja. How many years until moon tourism is reality? Um, good question. Uh, define tourism. Um, so when will a very rich person be able to go to the moon? I would say in about 20 years. Like if you're willing to spend $20 million dollars, in about 20 years from now, you'll be able to go to the moon, probably on a starship. And there'll be a bunch of people and they'll, they'll, they'll fly you to the moon, like with a bunch of people, you'll land on the moon, you'll go to the moon cafe, and then they will fly you back home. Maybe you'll spend a couple of days on them. I don't know if there'll be that level of infrastructure in, in 20 years though. When will regular people be able to fly to the moon and go there? Hundreds of years, I think. It's going to be a long time before there's enough infrastructure to bring down the price. Like, <clears throat> like you, you will get to a point now where you can decide um, house or trip to the moon. That'll, that should come within three, four decades, I think. Um... Let's see, Josh, have I read Artemis? I haven't read Artemis, uh, but I did interview Andy Weir here on this channel and we talked about Artemis. So if you want to see that, we can definitely, you can definitely search for Andy Weir on my channel and you'll see the conversation. Um, all right, so you're asking Dennis, uh, was it, someone's asking about, about whether the universe is computable. Um, uh, it's a good question. And, you know, I don't know the answer to it. I don't think anybody knows the answer to it. You know, is the universe touring complete? Um, don't know. It's, uh, it's a good question. We'll have to, have to figure it out. Um, John, why does it say that our universe is expanding at the speed of light if matter can't travel at the speed of light? Yeah, so, so material can't travel through the universe faster than the speed of light. But uh, the universe itself can expand faster than the speed of light. And think about like this idea that, you know, the way the expansion of the universe works from our perspective is that the farther we look, the the faster galaxies are moving away from us. And you get to a certain point that, that those galaxies are moving from our perspective faster than the speed of light. And if you're on one of those galaxies looking back at us from your perspective, we're moving faster than the speed of light. And the reality is like, I'm going to tell you the biggest bummer of the whole night, 94% of the observable universe has already fallen over the cosmic horizon. So 94% of the universe is already on its way or has already gone faster than the speed of light from our perspective. And therefore we can never reach it. So the actual explorable universe is that 6% that's left over. That's the accessible universe for any, you know, if the robot apocalypse happens tomorrow and the, and the staple, uh, the paperclip uh, manufacturers start going as quickly as they can, turning as much of the universe into paperclips as they can, 
only 6% of the universe will be accessible to them and the other 94 will never be accessible because it's already falling over the cosmic horizon from our perspective. And that's if you hurry. That's if you start right now. Not if you wait a few billion years, then even more of the universe will have fallen over the cosmic horizon. So, uh, yeah, the farther something is, the faster it's going. And, the f and things can be going faster than the speed of light. But from our perspective, they're not... Um, they're, but, but from our perspective, but they're not actually moving through space faster than the speed of light. Uh, Tom Watts said, if the moon is in Earth's gravity well, why is it moving away from us and not towards us? Well, so, I mean, the, this was, of course, the question that Newton figured out, which was like, what's with the moon? He looked, he looked up at the moon. He's like, does the, is the moon like stuff here on Earth? Why doesn't the moon just crash into the planet? And he realized that the moon was falling around the planet at a speed that it just always misses the planet. And it's the same thing as orbit. That's the same thing that happens to the International Space Station. The moon is doing the same thing. Now, the question that you're asking is why is the moon drifting away from the Earth? And the reason is because the moon is slowing down the Earth's rotation speed. And as the moon slows down the Earth's rotation speed, the total amount of momentum in the Earth-Moon system has to remain balanced. And so in order to compensate for slowing down the Earth's rotation speed, the moon has to uh, move outward just a tiny little bit every year. And the Earth's rotation slows down and the moon moves out and the Earth's rotation uh, slows down and the moon moves out and that's just what's happening. Now, if the moon was closer to the Earth, the magic number is the day length. So right now the moon takes 28 days to turn around, to go around the Earth. But if the moon took 23 hours to go around the Earth, then it would be doing the other thing. <clears throat> it would be speeding up the Earth's rotation and it would be drifting closer to us to compensate. And that's what's actually happening with Phobos is Phobos takes like 14 hours to orbit around Mars. And so it's actually speeding up Mars's rotation speed and it is moving closer to Mars to compensate. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Phobos is going to get torn apart and, and, uh, and crash into Mars. Uh, fast Hemi Machinist. Do we know how fast the universe is expanding? <laughs> yes, but this is like an argument now. Roughly 70-ish um, uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. But astronomers are getting different answers when they measure the expansion rate early on in the universe uh, and when they use different techniques. But roughly about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. In fact, this was, this is what Hubble, you know, the name Hubble is in our mind because he was the person who first helped us start to understand and measure the expansion rate of the universe. So we've known the rough expansion rate of the universe for a hundred years now. Um, <clears throat> oh, eight hours. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Powell. Maybe it was Deimos takes longer, but yeah, that's great. Eight hours. So there you go. Eight hours for, for phobos to go around mars um uh, kyle hunt has could venus or mercury eclipse the sun from our perspective and has it caused a shadow or temperature drop on earth so absolutely um in fact we so when mercury and venus pass in front of the sun from our perspective we call that a transit and there are about 13 transits of Mercury across the surface of the sun every century. So we see one every eight years or so. And there are two transits of Venus every 108 years. And so we saw one in 2012 and we saw one in 2004 because they're separated by eight years. And then we won't see another one for another 108 years. So. You know, I mean, I'll be into my second robot body, but many people will be dead um, when it happens again. Uh, but if you do a search on my channel, uh, you will watch an eight hour video um, where we did the Venus transit. We broadcast it live back in 2012. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Such great questions. Sorry, I, uh, I really enjoy this. 
Um, and we only got a couple of minutes left. So, Arjel, what do you think, what do we feel was the most significant scientific advance of the last 20 years? Uh, oh, that's so tough. It's so weird. It's so weird. I'm, I, you know, I don't have an answer for you. And I, I don't like um, those kinds of questions in general because it's really hard. Like, what's your favorite planet? What's your favorite place to go in the universe? What's your favorite spaceship? Um, what's your favorite scientific advance? Uh, I, there are so many. And so we did an episode of Astronomy Cast where we tried to think about all the big scientific updates. And we're so in the middle of it. You know, I'm reporting on incremental updates that are happening every day. And so I, I rarely get a chance to poke my head up and sort of look at the big, big picture stuff. The first photograph of, of the event horizon of a supermassive black hole is pretty big. The first images from the, of the surface of Pluto by a spacecraft is pretty big. Um, the discovery of the chemicals for life, the whole, just the whole concept of potentially life on Enceladus and, and Europa, um, the f discovery of planets orbiting other stars. I mean, if I was to go back to 1995, so 25 years, I'd probably say the first extrasolar planet would be the biggest scientific advance in space and astronomy and probably would be a contender for one of the most important discoveries in science entirely. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say, you know, give me 25 years and I'm going to say exoplanets. Um, Uh, Dwayne Duvall, didn't I hear that the expansion speed can be different in different parts of the universe somewhere? The assumption that astronomers make today is that the expansion rate across the entire universe is the same. Every cubic meter of space is expanding away from every other cubic meter of space at the same rate. Uh, if the And there's no observations that say that the expansion rate is different. Uh, it's possible that the expansion rate was different at different times in the universe. But that is still um, just a possibility to explain uh, the differences in the cosmological expansion rate of the universe. Um, Nicholas B. is saying, what about gravitational waves? See, everybody's putting in their, <laughs> their things. Yeah, um, but like if I had to choose between discovery of gravitational waves or the discovery, I mean, gravitational waves, yeah, amazing, right? A whole new method to perceive, a new sense uh, is pretty amazing. But if I had to choose between gravitational waves or planets orbiting other stars, I think I'd go with planets orbiting other stars. So that's just me. Um, but both, but don't make me choose. That's why I don't like these questions. I don't like to, I don't like to like, what is the best? I, I will push back and, and just rattle off a bunch of things that I like. Um, Mandanara. Do you think that we'll manage to survive and become renewable energy before we screw up the climate permanently? Hmm. So do I think we'll manage to survive? I got to parse out this question. So do I think we'll manage to survive? Yes. Become to, and become renewable. Yes. Before we screw up the climate permanently. No. So I think that we will survive. I think that we will become renewable and I think we will screw up the climate permanently. Uh, we will, you know, it's just, there's just too many events that are now just no way to stop the, the, you know, and so we will we'll reach some new, like new normal, um, ideally without having to do some kind of geoengineering. But I think, uh, we're, we've set too many things in motion. So we're going to have to adapt to a changing environment as quickly as we can. And hopefully we can minimize the suffering on human lives and the environment and just species on earth. And that's really the question is, can we, can we minimize our impact? And that's what I have. That's the unknown. And I have hope that we can, and I hope we're able to do it. So 
All right, we've reached the uh, the end of our hour. So once again, um, we're going to have uh, Twain. Don't even say that. When is James Webb ex- supposed to explode on the pad? October twenty first is when James Webb will fly to space. All right, twenty twenty one. So um, yeah, so thank you everybody for watching. I of course have a really good time with this. Uh, more episodes coming that were in the works. Another question show in the works. Uh, we're doing an episode on rogue planets. Because uh, we had a pretty big scoop on Universe Today this week about a uh, an Earth mass rogue planet in the in the Milky Way, so I want to just do a big deep dive into rogue planets. So I'm working on that right now. Um, but yeah, so thanks to all the moderators, thanks everyone watching today. Thank you to all of our patrons. Uh, I hope you and everyone who asked a question. Lots more good content coming this week, so just check out the calendar. If you haven't already, I list all of the upcoming events in my weekly email newsletter. So if you haven't already got it, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter, and you can get that. All right. Uh, There you go. There's a listing of some of the events coming up. Look at all those great guests. Jill Tarter, Alan Stern. It's going to be crazy. All right. We'll see you guys all later.